Good morning guys, happy Friday, and um, yeah, it's actually Friday. It's Friday morning and this video is going up today. So that's how this week has gone. Let me get out my notes. I think it was two weeks ago I posted a video letting you guys know that I suspect I might have a CSF leak. And in that video, oh, I'll put a card here. And in that video I told you guys that I was just waiting for this neurosurgery appointment that I've been waiting for for five, six months, something like that. Well, this week I finally had that neurosurgery appointment. So today I'm going to give you an update on how the CSF leak diagnosis testing, all of that is going. Progress report. For context, I really do think that it's important that you started the last video, so I already put a card before the little jingle thing, but I will also put a link in the description below so that you can make sure you're completely up to date with why I suspect that I have a CSF leak before you watch anything in this video. Because if you don't watch that, this might not make much sense. Before we get into the appointment with the neurosurgeon, I need to let you guys know why I saw this neurosurgeon in particular. Basically, it's because it's the only one that I could find in my area that knows anything about CSF leaks. I live in a sort of small town, it's not like the tiniest place, but it is pretty small, so there aren't a lot of people who know about CSF leaks. So I got hooked up with an ENT, and that appointment didn't go very well, and then I also got hooked up with this neurologist, and this appointment honestly could have gone better as well. But I don't want to hear from you guys that I'm just going to the wrong doctor. I swear this is just the doctor that, like, when I called they said this is the lady who knows anything about CSF leaks. Clearly, she is not going to be the person who gets to the bottom of this for us. But I had to get through her because she's near me before I could really rationalize the next step for me, which is to go out of state to a doctor who takes the glucose testing seriously. If you have no idea what I'm talking about when I talk about glucose, again, third and last time, very important that you check out the video from two weeks ago where I exposed everything about the CSF symptoms. Check the link in the description. Now for this appointment, I don't know the exact order of events, but I do think that most of it's here. I'm super interested to hear what you guys think because a lot of the stuff that this doctor said contradicts the things that I've heard, that I've read scientifically, that I've heard anecdotally, and what the CSF leak community seems to believe online. I obviously don't think that we should be believing strangers online over our doctors for a lot of stuff, but that doesn't mean that doctors can't be wrong, and I think it's important for me to know as much as I can going into the next doctor so that I can be better prepared than I was for this appointment, just like I was more prepared for this appointment than I was for the last appointment. So if you guys have any experience with CSF leaks and you're able to let me know anything in the comments, please do. It would really help me out a lot. And I'm particularly interested to know if any of you guys have symptoms that this doctor said was impossible to have with a leak. She said a lot of things that didn't agree with the things that I've read. So if you guys have also read the opposite of what she said, then I can feel more confident. Really, I'm just looking for confidence from you guys. Give me confidence. Thank you. By the way, bonus if you put source links. Oh, I'm so glad that I have notes for this so I don't forget things. Another thing, if you are in the United States and you know of any doctors who treat CSF leaks, who do take the glucose test seriously, and who see patients out of state using their insurance, please comment their name, slide in my DM on Instagram. I don't care how you get a hold of me. Please get a hold of me and let me know who these doctors are. I've been having a heck of a time finding doctors who do televisits, who take insurance. I have a pretty widely accepted Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, PPO plan, so I'm able to see almost anyone. It's just been really difficult to find somebody who can like test and diagnose remotely, and then I would be willing to travel for surgery with the right doctor if that's what it came to. But at least for like the tests and the diagnosis and stuff, I just need a doctor that takes this glucose test seriously who's willing to investigate. I'm not looking for like an instant diagnosis or anything, but I just need somebody who's willing to investigate and who's up to date with the more recent scientific findings for this condition. Okay, the appointment. The MRI is normal. That's one of the very first things that she said, MRI is normal. I already knew that. This was my third brain MRI in like a year and a half, so absolutely no surprises there. And that doesn't really mean anything to me because I know that 20%-ish, maybe over 20% of CSF leak patients do have normal MRIs. Um, then she asked a lot of questions about how I feel in different positions, and I mean a lot of questions. She really seemed to be harping on this, and I don't know what she was looking for, but I didn't really feel like I was giving her what she was looking for. One of the biggest symptoms of a CSF leak is positional headache, so I was trying to describe to her my positional headache. But as a lot of you guys know, I also have positional tachycardia. I also have positional blood pressure problems, and they change whether I'm normal gen or migraine gen. So this doctor was like, so... 
do you feel better or worse upright? And I had to put all these qualifiers on everything I said. Well, if I'm migrainey and I haven't eaten a lot of salt that day, then if I stand up, I might get palpitations, then I'll get lightheaded and I have to lay down. But if I have had a lot of salt that day, maybe I can stand up, but then if my nose starts dripping, I'll need to lay down. But if my nose hasn't dripped a lot that day, then laying down, that's gonna hurt a lot. I'm gonna have to sleep on a wedge. But you know, if I start to get palpitations, then maybe the whooshing in my head will be more favorable than having the palpitations, so I might choose to lay down anyway, and that'll be better, because it's better than having a panic attack. You know, blah, blah, blah. And she's like looking for a distinct, okay, hold on, so if it's morning and you just woke up and you didn't have a migraine last night, I'm like, hold on, how did I not have a migraine last night? What happened to make me not have a migraine last night? Was it my own doing? Was it because I rested? Was it because I aborted? Was it because, well, so just like all these qualifiers, I don't think she was that into that. I don't know what she was looking for when I was talking to her, but she didn't really seem to like my answers about my positional headaches. And I understand, lady. I'm sorry. It's a lot for me, too. I kind of have to blow my nose. Hold on. This is my ginger tea of today. Then she asked if I've had any fractures. I said, I mean, sorta, of, I've had a lot of fractures like my wrist, random stuff. Oh, this wrist. I told her no, nothing confirmed, no confirmed fractures in my head, but I have hit my head very hard, two to three distinct times. One of them is like half hard, but two very huge hits to the head, one moderately huge hit to the head just because of my athletic history. I also have bone spurs in my neck. I have military neck. I'm suspected EDS. We're like 96% sure that I have EDS. And this whole thing started after an ear infection in my right ear, which is the side where all of this stuff seems to happen worse. All the whooshing is worse on my right ear. The ear bombs are worse on my right ear. The ringing is worse on my right ear. And it was my right ear that got infected. So even though I haven't had any fractures, I do have a lot of other conditions or other incidents that could increase my chances of having a CSF leak. And then at that point, my husband chimed in something that I had forgotten about, like my neck or something or my lumbar, and the doctor kind of snapped at him. She goes, that's not her skull. And then I was like, uh, yeah, okay, um, no skull fractures. I haven't fractured my skull. She hadn't specifically asked about the skull, but she wanted to know specifically about the skull. Every time I switch sides, I get tea. Then we moved on to talking about meningitis, because she said if she was to do any treatment for a CSF leak, the point is to make sure that meningitis doesn't happen. Now, I honestly have not looked into meningitis almost at all because I figured if I had meningitis, I would know it and I didn't want to freak myself out about meningitis and the symptoms of it and then be looking for those symptoms or something. I don't need to know. It's not affecting me right now. My limited understanding of meningitis is that if you have a tear somewhere in your dura, then the bacteria can get into where your brain and everything is and you get this really bad infection in your brain and you can end up hospitalized from it. Some people probably die from it. I betcha. I'm not Googling it. So she asked me if I've had meningitis. I said, not that I know of. Is it something that you could miss or is it something that you would definitely know about? And she said, oh no, no, you would definitely know about it because you'd be hospitalized. So we concluded that I have not had meningitis. I will also chime in here that I am vaccinated for meningitis, but I don't know if the meningitis that you get vaccinated for is necessarily the same strain of meningitis that you get with CSF leaks. Don't know, but I do have the vaccination. I didn't remember about the vaccination until I was home from the appointment though. She told me that if this was a CSF leak and I have been symptomatic for so long, then I definitely would have had meningitis by now. She confirmed that I've been symptomatic for many years and I said yes. And she said, okay, if you did have a CSF leak, you definitely would have been infected by now. So I asked for clarification about the by now thing because I have never seen anything in my readings or heard from the other patients who were misdiagnosed for many years that they had meningitis within the first several years of their condition. So I asked her what she meant by by now and she said, it's been years, definitely by now. And I said, yeah, but what do you mean like by now? And she repeated definitely shorter than years. Brilliant husband comes in, he's like, so if it's not years, is it days, weeks, months? one year? When do you actually predict that this would happen? Because it sounds like it's a pretty predictable complication from the way that she's describing it. And she said, definitely within a few months, I would have had meningitis. Is that true? Probably not. Because when I went home and Googled it, the paper that I came across said that the rate is about 10% per year for unrepaired leaks. And the overall is 19% for persistent leaking out of the nose. 
I also know that a lot of people get misdiagnosed for many years. So this was the first little bit of like, okay, this doctor thinks that this is a really easy, clear thing to diagnose and it isn't from what I've read. So this is when the red flags really started showing up for me. I was like, she is trivializing the difficulty sometimes of finding these leaks. With that part, it kind of made me upset because once she had determined that I didn't have meningitis and that I hadn't had meningitis in several years, it kind of felt like she stopped caring about really getting to the bottom of the problem. That part of the appointment really felt like two things. One, that she's really only interested in keeping that horrible, horrible thing, that meningitis, from happening. That they're really only concerned with the life-threatening thing. They're not concerned until something serious and tangible and testable happens. And that's a really big problem with being in the chronic illness community and having symptoms that are more generic. The doctor isn't really trying to test me, she's just trying to avoid meningitis. She doesn't want me dead on her watch. And two, goes along with that, she really wasn't concerned with alleviating my symptoms. She stopped asking about my symptoms. Later on, she really demonstrated it, but she didn't seem to be listening, or maybe she was listening, but she wasn't fully absorbing the true severity of the symptoms that I go through. She didn't really seem like she understood that this is affecting me every single day. I'm disabled by it, I lost my job from it. It's controlling my life, it's controlling my family's life, it's controlling my relationships with everyone, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's controlling everything, and she did not seem concerned with that at all. Tradition. Then she had me bend over with a cup to see if any drips would come out so they could collect the sample and then send that off for testing. And I told her, unfortunately, you can kind of tell by how well I'm talking in sentences, I'm not leaking a lot right now and I'm not going to be able to collect enough sample for you. I just don't leak very much out of my nose. But she wanted to try it anyway and I thought that that was the right thing to do. I knew that for that test I needed like half a teaspoon or a teaspoon of fluid to come out of my nose and the most I ever drip at once is like one or two drops. For some leakers, for like the really obvious leakers, they bend over and it just comes out like a faucet. Or for some people it's a really steady drip and they're able to get a good amount of sample in the cup. For me, the most I ever get is like a couple drops at a time. And it's not even always. Like sometimes if I bend, a few drops will come out. Sometimes I'll feel it up here, but it'll be dry by the time it gets to the tip of my nose. That's what was happening at the doctor. And sometimes it's dry. When I'm feeling really well, or if I leaked a lot for like a whole week, then sometimes I'll get a couple of days of dry. But I knew with this doctor that it was not gonna come out. I am really glad that we tried anyway though. So when I told the doctor it's not gonna happen right now because I'm not leaking right now, she said that there's no such thing as intermittent leaking. And that's kind of weird because that goes against the whole theory that I have right now, which is that I'm in this cycle of high and low pressure, or if high is here and low is here, then I'm staying in the middle and I'm kind of just oscillating between the two. But she said that there's no such thing as intermittent leaking, and that if I bent down, it would be like a faucet. Otherwise, I don't have a CSF leak. Um... Not the impression that I have. After several minutes of me being in that head down position, she was like, you know what, it's been a really long time that you've been like this. There just isn't any evidence that you have a CSF leak. So I told her, I mean, it does leak sometimes. I mean, I've dripped on the baby before. And she said, well, then why don't you take the cup home and you can see if you can collect it at home. Okay. So we asked her about how we should treat the sample if we do take it at home. Because everything that I've read says that you need to keep it on ice, you need to keep it cold, because the protein is very unstable. Sorry, I'm trying to pop my thumb. That's why my hand is a claw right now. There, it's popped. I also read that this test has a super high rate of false negatives because oftentimes a sample is mishandled before it gets processed and you end up with a false negative. Doctor said, don't worry, the protein is really stable, it'll be fine. I double checked. I really don't think it's a stable protein. I don't think she knows what she's talking about. I think that she only confirms leakers that are like those faucets, so she's used to having tons of sample, and yeah, if you have tons of sample, it doesn't matter if 99% of it breaks down. You still have that 1%, which is still a lot of sample. But if I've got like four drops, and you need half a teaspoon, and 99% of my four drops breaks down, you're not gonna get a positive test, even if it is positive. My husband also asked, what if the leak is such that not all of it is coming out of the nose? What if most of it's going down the back of the throat and only some of it's coming out of the nose? but unfortunately she dismissed that question too. During this time I was still bent over trying to get my nose to leak anything into the cup and I kind of turned my head a little bit and said, have you ever done pledgets? Do you ever do pledget studies for the patients who come in here with suspected CSF leaks? Now pledgets, I mentioned it in the last video but I'll refresh right now. It's little tampons basically that they put up in your nose. 
way up in your nose. I think they might even numb you and then throw the pledgets in. And those are for low volume leakers, like me, or at least that's what I read. With this doctor, when I asked her if she ever does pledgets for low volume leakers, she said no. Pledgets are only for finding the location of the leak, not for finding whether there is a leak. That is completely not what I've heard before, and I'm also wondering, like, if the leak is a faucet, do you really have trouble finding it without pledgets? You know what I mean? Now, unfortunately, I wasn't a thousand percent sure on the reason for pledgets because she sounded so confident when she said they're for the location of the leak, not for small volume leaks. But when I got home and looked it back up, I was still finding things about that they're for small volume leaks. So let me know what you guys think, what you guys know, what you've read. She sounded really confident. I was decently confident, but I didn't want to push where I wasn't a thousand percent sure. So I said something really non-committal like, oh, okay, interesting. And she got snappy. She goes, you do not have a CSF leak, honey. She called me honey. In that moment, I could feel my eyes welling up because if a doctor calls you honey and the doctor is relatively close in age to you and the doctor is spending the whole appointment trying to dismiss you and not get to your questions, it feels really condescending. That was like the moment where everything switched. Like even if this lady finds my leak, she is not going to be my surgeon because you, you can't just call people honey because they're disagreeing with you and you want to like feel like you're in charge. That just You don't call people honey. Now, reminder, I was still bent over with the cup at that point, so she didn't know that I was so bothered by the stuff that she was saying. I really wanted to say, don't call me honey, but I didn't because I was already feeling a little bit frustrated, and I don't react on impulse when I already feel frustrated. That's my rule at the doctor's office. Once you're frustrated, no more impulsive snaps. Otherwise, I would have been like, um, don't call me honey. But it may have been more rude than I intended, so if I do feel a little bit of fire in my chest, I prefer to play on the safe side and be a little bit extra polite over playing on the normal gen side and saying every remark that I think of because I'm really fast at rebuttals and facts and science. What it sounds like to me is that in order to have a CSF leak, according to this doctor, you need to have an abnormal MRI, a literal faucet to test, meningitis within a few months of symptom onset, and a skull fracture. And or maybe, and or a skull fracture. So given this information, one of two things must be true. Either these things are always present for a leak and she's never had a patient that she's turned away come back later and let her know that she was wrong, or she meant usually, not always. But if that's the case, then this is bothersome as well. Because what if I'm just part of the usually and not part of the always? What if I'm the outlier? Again, we asked, and again, she was dismissive. My husband even brought up the story of his glossopharyngeal neuralgia. He had atypical neuralgia, and it was on an atypical nerve. So not only was it in an atypical place on his face, I meant pain when I said it back there. Not only was the pain in an atypical place, it was also presenting atypically. So it took years to get that diagnosis. Diagnosis. <laughs> And he brought up that story to be like, yeah, I was atypical. And he didn't directly make the connection for her, but we were hoping that she would make the connection. Like, what if I'm the atypical? If there was ever a patient to test who could fall into that usually, wouldn't someone as symptomatic as me be the right person to test? And if not, what is it that she was looking for? What am I missing that's making her not take me seriously just because I didn't have ABCD? Or does she really truly think that you need to be fractured skull, spilling like a faucet, have meningitis in order to have a CSF leak that you should take seriously. Like, really. When I put it like that, it's pretty difficult to believe that this is what happened. And also, guys, I told you in the last video, but worth reiterating, I tried making this appointment like five months ago, and they deferred it the entire time because of problems with getting the MRI, getting the MRI with contrast because I was pregnant, and then I had the baby. I explained that whole story before, so I won't explain it again now. But if it was that easy to diagnose a CSF leak, and I specifically called them saying, hey, I'm looking for someone who can help me with diagnosing a potential CSF leak, why did she delay my appointment and make me go through all these symptoms for an extra six months? if it was really that easy to diagnose, if it's that easy to identify. And I already had an MRI without contrast that was normal. And I had an MRI with and without contrast that was normal from a year prior, which was three or four years after symptom onset. You'd think she would know from that that I was fine. Why did they delay me? Why did they make me go through all those symptoms for so many months if it was gonna be that simple to identify? Just food for thought. She did seem a little bit frustrated that we kept pushing for testing and 
you know, asking more and more questions. So at that point, she started kind of trying to end the conversation by saying things like that she doesn't want to do anything to treat me or test me that could disrupt my quality of life. Again, I feel two ways about that comment. One, are you not listening to how bad my quality of life is now? And two, why do you think I'm here? I'm only here to get tests and stuff done. I'm here to ask you if you think that this is a possibility. Do you think I'm here asking for brain surgery because you're a brain surgeon? That comment kind of sounds like she thinks I came in to be like, I think I need brain surgery. That's not what happened. We're just having a conversation. But apparently telling her that I'm in this horrible cycle where every single day over the course of the afternoon I get more and more confused until I eventually can't say sentences, I lay down, I shake uncontrollably, I become paralyzed, and then I fall asleep, wake up in a puffy, stuffed up, congested, confused haze with a pulsatile headache, get up, drip out of my face for the whole day, and do it again the next night. All of that has not disrupted my quality of life, thankfully. At this point, I realized that I needed to be a little bit more blunt with the emotional impact that this has and the true impact that this has on someone's life. So I told her at that point, you cannot mess up my life more than it already is. This already took my job. This already controls every aspect of my life. My life as I know it is already over. And she said, well, you're young and you're healthy, well, relatively healthy, and I don't want to f you up. I'm young and healthy, and she doesn't want to f me up. That's why she won't listen to me about my symptoms. Let that sink in. That's why I can't get tests done. She doesn't want to f me up. What's this accomplishing? You put this off for five months just to tell me that? Let's brighten the mood back up again really quickly though by reminding you that this is a customer service interaction. She's hired by the hospital to do a job. You're going in and you're paying that doctor to do a service for you. The service that they do is to be the doctor and make sure that you're not being unreasonable with like the tests and the prescriptions that you want to listen and diagnose and help you get to the bottom of the problem. If you hire someone to do a job and instead of doing the job, they swear at you, they're snappy, they're dismissive, they're condescending, fire them. This chick, fired. But you know what? I was already there, so more questions. Just keep asking questions. Let's try to get to the bottom of this. Let's try to work together, even if it doesn't really feel like we're getting along right now. So I looped back to the fluid drip. What could it be? And she said allergies. She asked me if I've ever gotten an allergy test, if I've ever done food eliminations, other types of things like that. Have I been to an allergist? So I did list off the elimination diets that I've done, let her know that I did get an allergy test done and that I did a few triggers for me. Told her that I also did six months of the nasal steroid Flonase and didn't have any changes in symptoms from that. And then my husband chimed in and said, would allergies have the salty metallic taste? And she said yes. Honestly, salty, I buy. I buy that allergies would definitely taste salty. I don't know if I've ever heard of allergies tasting metallic, but fair enough. We also asked if the allergy drips would contain high glucose, and she said yes. But then later on, she kind of walked it back and she said that glucose wasn't part of her training, that measuring things with glucose isn't reliable, and that they don't use glucose testing as any kind of reliable, um, what's another word for reliable so I can stop saying reliable, whatever, reliable test. So that was a little bit of a strange flip-flop. She said something that was vague and I asked for something specific and then she disagreed with the vague thing that she had said. I don't know if she's used to patients paying this close of attention to what she's saying or like asking follow-up questions to, it's not, um, what I'm trying to say is she would have to be very knowledgeable in order to answer the questions that I was asking and given that she's a brain surgeon who treats this, I expected her to know the answers to these questions. That's what I was trying to say, I think, I don't know. <laughs> She said that measuring with glucose wasn't part of her training, and so I told her that the doctor's office that I've been in touch with out of state takes a glucose reading that's over 30 from the nasal as a good indication that you have a CSF leak because normal nasal secretions only have less than 10, so over 30, big problems. Doctor said, if another doctor said that, go see that doctor. She like rolls her eyes, doesn't like hearing it. Pro tip, when you're in the doctor's office, don't mention what other doctors have told you. They hate when you pit them against each other. That's a really fast way to get on their bad side. 
I have lots of other tips like that for little nuances that I've found with doctors over the years. And I'm thinking next week I will post on Friday, not Tuesday Q&A, but I'm thinking next week on Friday I'll post a video with more of my tips for being a patient and advocating for yourself when a doctor is being dismissive. I'm becoming a bit of a pro. It's horrible for me, but all of us together we can crowdsource and we can get better at this. Also, kind of ironic that she told me to go to another doctor out of state after forcing me to wait until after the baby was born to get treated. Because going to somewhere out of state when you're disabled is a lot easier before you give birth than it is after you give birth. She asked me if I've done any alternative therapies, so I listed off things like massage, chiropractic, acupuncture, to name a few. She said that the reason why she asks is because sometimes Western medicine can just be behind. She said Western medicine can move kind of slowly, so maybe the doctor that I've been in touch with out of state is just a little bit more up to date on the newest and latest information. And I thought that was also a little bit ironic because I'm like, lady, you are Western medicine. This is why you're behind. It's because I'm presenting you with new information that I've found and you're not interested in learning it. And I'm not even telling you to take my word for it. Maybe just Google it. Get on PubMed. Get on Google Scholar. See how you feel about it. But I'm like presenting information. You should probably hear it. She really sincerely looked me in the eyes and said, you know, I really wish that I could have been the doctor to solve this for you. And I do truly feel like she meant that. But it was hurtful that her being a doctor made her think that I didn't know what I was talking about. That's another thing I think that you should kind of let sink in. That person being a doctor doesn't mean that you don't know what you're talking about. That and more tips next week. Make sure that you subscribe. Since Western medicine is really behind, she recommended that I go see a naturopath. And it kind of felt like she wanted me to go to a naturopath because she doesn't believe in it. But I'm a crazy lady who just believes everything that I read on the internet. So if I go to a naturopath, I'm going to believe it and the placebo effect will make everything better. That's truly what I felt like. I felt like she was just trying to dump me off on a naturopath, get me out, and that she thought that that would actually make me feel better, but it didn't seem like she thought there was validity to the stuff that I was feeling. And I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I'm not set on having any one diagnosis, but this one is plausible enough that we need to take it seriously and test it. That's it. Just want to get tested, or if a doctor is going to have evidence against it and convince me that I don't have it, then they need to say things that line up with scientific literature. If they tell me things that do not match scientific literature, I am not inclined to believe it and I will keep advocating and keep pushing to test for this diagnosis. Once we properly eliminate it as an option, I will happily stop pushing. Going back to the whole this is a customer service interaction thing, I really wanted to tell her, look, doctor, honey, your job is to help me check these boxes off, not to jump to conclusions before we even get a chance to talk. I wouldn't have said it with honey. That would have pissed her off. But it was funny to throw in for the video. As a very last question, obviously I have a lot of migraine things. I had a migraine question for her. I asked her if she's a doctor that I could ask about my migraine question or if that would have to go to someone else. She scoffed, rolls her eyes. She goes, I'm a brain surgeon. I'm like, uh, okay. Um, she goes, you need a neurologist. Oh, I need a neurologist. And you're a neurosurgeon. Sue me for thinking you might know some of the same things as a neurologist. But I didn't ask her my migraine question. She went ahead and referred me to neurology. So if I like this neurologist, then hey, I'll have a new neurologist in my area. So that's pretty cool. So guys, that's how that appointment went. To be honest, I really do feel like she was decently nice between the comments that came off as rude or dismissive. I do really truly feel like she means well and she wants me to feel better. But also I feel like the doctor's office is literally the last place where I should feel like I have to fight and advocate in order to be heard. I don't think doctors like this realize how deeply painful it can be to be repeatedly let down or dismissed as a patient. Especially when, like this doctor, they either don't acknowledge or they downplay the suffering that the patient is going through, oftentimes every single day. As a patient, you go in really hopeful that this doctor is going to be the one who listens and tries to understand, asks a bunch of questions, pokes a bunch of holes, throws out a bunch of different options or a bunch of different possibilities and tries to really narrow things down with you. And you really do work up this courage to go back into the hospital after you get treated like this. And so to be treated like this again can really bring you down as a patient. I don't think that the doctor is trying to do that. I don't think that they understand the depth of the pain that they cause.
or how many spoons it takes to go and see them. So yeah, I really wish that she would have picked my brain and helped identify the problem. But you know what? If she's not the one, then she's not the one. I'm gonna give myself a little bit of a mental health break, and then in days or weeks or even months, whenever I feel like I can pick this back up again, I'm gonna keep going. And actually, you guys can help me with this. If you guys know of doctors in the United States, like I said before, who take insurance, who can do the testing and diagnosis and televisits until we have the diagnosis and if it comes down to surgery, then I will travel to the right doctor for surgery. But I can't like pay out of pocket just to find a doctor who will take the glucose seriously out of state. It's just like, this is getting really expensive and time consuming. So crowdsource guys, help me. I'm in the United States, let's go. I'm gonna leave you with my three takeaways. Number one, being a doctor doesn't make you the smartest person in the room. Going through the most school doesn't make you the smartest person in the room. There are really brilliant people in our society who have never finished high school even, and there are ding-dongs who have PhDs. Amount of school or having a doctor title does not make you the smartest or the most knowledgeable person in the room. Side note, your status as a doctor doesn't mean that I'm expecting you to know everything. It's okay to say, I'm not sure, I'll have to check on that or let me Google that really quickly, or let me check in this textbook, or let me jog my memory. That's okay to say. It doesn't make you dumb. It doesn't make you less of a doctor. It doesn't make it so people aren't gonna take you seriously. In fact, I would have highly preferred that to this doctor kind of pretending that she knew more than she did. It made it so that we weren't able to be as productive. Takeaway number two, the doctor vowed to do no harm, and inaction can be just as harmful as a harmful action. In the case of this appointment, this doctor's inaction has done me much more harm than the action of just doing pledges on me or something like that. Making me wait and then not listening. Inaction caused suffering. And finally, takeaway number three. You guys know that I am a veteran of the hospital and the nurses and doctors that I've talked to in some of the situations we've been in have said that patients do need to advocate for themselves. I think it's important for you guys to know that even internally, some of the doctors and nurses know that this is a problem. On the one hand, it's awful that they see it and it hasn't changed. But on the other hand, it's awesome that they see it. Change is coming. We just have to keep being kind and keep talking. Voice your opinion, keep being polite. It does seem like we're making progress. Now I know that when you're trying to advocate for yourself with the doctor, it can be really difficult to strike that balance between being polite and being honest. Sometimes you can't do both. So next week, I'm gonna do my patient perspective and let you guys know the tips that I have for advocating for yourself. If you have anything that you'd like to add that you think is really important to put into that video, please drop those in the comments below as well. That is an excellent video to crowdsource on before I even make it. I'll take my tips, combine them with your tips, and make one big video for next Friday. Or two Fridays, if I end up getting sick. It's tough having a newborn and also making YouTubes. All right, that's it. Goodbye, friends, and thanks in advance for any advice that you're able to give me, whether that be about the things that this doctor said, doctors that you think I should talk to or see or consider, or advice that you have that I could share next week. Those are the three things that I want to hear about in the comments. Thank you. See you next week.